Great. Good morning, everybody, and welcome here to Scunthorpe United Football Club, uh, who are kindly hosting us here this morning. Uh, my name's Richard Tice. I am the chairman of the Brexit Party and a newly elected MEP. Um, not, not, um, and uh, uh, slightly strange being hired for a job that we want to be fired from quite quickly. Um, but um, uh, and on my panel here, uh, I'm delighted to introduce on the right hand side or your left is John Longworth, uh, another uh, elected MEP as well as Jake Pugh, uh, elected MEP, both from uh, elected for Yorkshire. I was elected for the Eastern Region. And then uh, our specialist in the steel industry, Simon Boyd, who's chief executive of Reed Steel. And we'll be hearing from all of them shortly. Um, so uh, just as a quick sort of recap, we, uh, as you know, the European elections were um, a couple of weeks ago, and we, the Brexit Party, are now the largest party in the European Parliament with 29 MEPs. We, um, uh, we, we did agree to share that with the CDU, uh, who've been around quite a long time, uh, as the other joint largest party. Um, and, uh, you know, we look forward to making a constructive contribution to uh, Brussels in due course. Um, <laughs> Uh, in our usual way. Um, but actually, uh, there's a huge amount to be done because we all know the benefits of leaving is that you can take back control of lots of important things for our economy, our society and our communities. And one of those is what we believe is a strategic national industry. And that's the steel industry because steel is absolutely at the core of so much that we do, that we build, that we make. It is absolutely critical, there's no question, it is a strategic national industry. And we have very, very serious concerns that this government, and indeed predecessor governments, have completely failed to recognise it as such. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that actually they haven't been in control of their own destiny because so much of what is involved to properly look after a strategic national industry is actually at the behest of the European Union. And so, so much that you might want to do in order to be able to invest in it, to grow it, to protect it where it needs protecting, actually we're not allowed to do. And we have, of course, a long track record of playing by the rules which is not something that we can always say about some of our others. So um, that's why uh, essentially as, as one of the very first things that we are saying uh, as the Brexit party in terms of policy, we are here talking about steel because it is urgent. Because sadly, as we know, British Steel has gone into official receivership and this is absolutely current as we speak. So it's really, really vital that we have a view on it and we say to people, the world at large, uh, our thoughts and how actually uh, some proposals could come forward to ensure that we protect what is a strategic national industry. So without further ado, I'm going to ask John Longworth, um, a Yorkshire MEP, to come and talk further. John, by way of background, uh, was the former Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce um, and was previously involved in a number of other large multinational businesses and is very experienced. And so please give a great welcome to John to talk about this further. Good morning. Great to be here in my home county of Yorkshire. Um, I, I'm um, <laughs> and North Lincolnshire. <laughs> yes, I should have said oh, Yorkshire and the Humber. Um, of course, I was elected as MEP for Yorkshire and the Humber. I thought you'd like to be part of Yorkshire, actually, in this part of the world. <laughs> um, I'm um, Richard mentioned the fact, of course, that I'm. Uh, 
was Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, but little known fact also is that I was also Chairman uh, for five years of the Distributed Trades Panel of the CBI. We like the CBI, don't we? And I was their economic spokesperson. So I have a very good uh, insight into uh, the views of trade associations and their, uh, the way in which they formulate their policies, uh, which are, uh, and most importantly, the fact that these organizations are not representative of all business. In fact, far from it. If you had all the trade associations together in the UK, they would represent only one in five businesses. And that's one of the issues actually uh, relating to uh, strategic industries like steel because um, they have actually been let down, badly let down by public policy in the UK. And one of the things we wanted to do today was to highlight the ways in which we can actually get control of public policy and the way public policy can help those strategic industries, which is so important to the UK, once we've left the European Union. In fact, I would say that bearing in mind that the government have promised that we will leave on the 31st of October, and given the urgency of dealing with these matters in relation to British Steel, the government really ought to say, we're going to implement those public policy changes now. Never mind waiting for the 31st of October. We'll do it now, and we'll, you know, if the EU wants to take action, then so be it. But we ought to actually make the environment for big strategic industries favourable right now. Those public policy issues that we would be particularly interested in addressing, of course, will, in essence, reduce free market competition a little bit in order to actually protect those industries that are vital to the UK as a sovereign state. You know, we cannot have armaments production, shipbuilding, etc., without high quality steel. And if we lose the blast furnaces from the UK, which are really only in this region, South Wales, then we will end up with a situation where we will not be able to produce those vital raw materials for our defence, amongst other things. And because it might reduce the competition a little bit, uh, we need to incentivise the way in which these companies actually operate. So I'll say first of all that if we were, um, we were in government, we would actually want to create an environment in which we would encourage ownership of these sorts of organisations, British Steel included, to be along a um, share ownership model whereby the employees themselves are given a share in the business. A mixed model which would include private investment and shareholding, employee shareholding and long-term patient capital which is so important for these businesses and which, are, which essentially other countries provide to their industries but we are actually unable to and I'll come on to the reasons for that in a moment. But that John Lewis style share ownership then incentivizes uh, the uh, high efficiency and productivity of these sorts of businesses, even where competition might be reduced to some degree. So, what are those public policy measures? Well, you know, first of all, there's the public procurement rules. The, Euro the European Union actually require, through a very complex public procurement process, which incidentally uh, shuts out small and medium-sized enterprises because it's too complicated for them to actually address and, and actually work their way through. It, through that process, uh, it also then inc increases the cost to the public purse because the very best, most efficient ways of, produce, of procuring things for the government cannot be achieved because the public procurement rules sh shut out SMEs. But it also, of course, causes huge problems for strategic industries like British Steel because the UK is not allowed under the European rules effectively to favour national industries for things as vital as shipbuilding, for example, as defence contracts. So the changing of the an abandonment of the European public procurement rules would actually allow us to favour uh, UK industries for strategic purposes. And that would actually provide a favourable environment for British Steel to prosper.
And let's face it, you know, every other country in the world does this through a variety of means. The US defense industry supports US industry hugely. State level public procurement in the US is a matter for individual states, Texas, Wyoming and so on. And they effectively support their local industries and shut out competition through that means in order to support the local economy. It's only <coughs> the, the UK, and of course the the Europeans themselves also cheat in this respect. You know, the French put in public procurement uh, contracts, uh, requirements around the environment, which might relate to the distance that things can be procured from. So to reduce uh, energy usage in transport, they'll require uh, a, a radius, 50 miles, whatever it is, for um, public procurement for French uh, uh, government contracts. That in itself, of course, then immediately favours French businesses because it has to be within a, a certain radius. There's all sorts of things go on across the continent and across the world which favour um, national industries that are important through public procurement. What do we do? Through the uh, European, because of the European rules, we open it out to everybody. And by doing that, we effectively undermine these vital strategic industries. So that needs to be addressed. And we can address it when we leave the European Union. But of course, what we should really be doing is addressing it right now. Then there's, of course, the whole issue of access to finance, finance and state aid. You know, the Germans set up, well, actually, they didn't. The, Ger the British and the Americans, after World War II, set up a reconstruction bank in Germany to help to reconstruct the German economy. It, it's now called the KfW network, regional banks which are supported by state funds. That regional banking system in Germany put 30 billion euros into the German economy, free of state aid rules, at low interest rates, long-term patient capital. The French and the Italians also have similar organisations. Do you know the European Union prevents us from doing that? The reason is very simply this. Those institutions were set up by us before the Treaty of Rome was signed and therefore are exempt from European rules. If we were to try and replicate that now, the European Union would take action against us. So we have a situation where even though we might want to provide in the UK long-term patient capital, uh, we do have, of course, some resistance to this, principally in the city, because it is viewed as competition, but all other countries do it, including the United States, by the way, Silicon Valley's origins are effectively long-term patient capital from state-backed business banks at state level in the United States. Silicon Valley would never exi existed without them. Because we want to do that and are prevented from doing it, our industries, our strategic industries like British Steel, are operating on what is not a level playing field. And we've got to get rid of this, um, this, this regime that the European Union force upon us, which prevent us from providing long-term patient capital to small businesses, but also, very importantly, to, long, to big strategic industries like British Steel. And part of the mix of supporting industries like British Steel would be to have long-term patient capital, capital that is not share capital, but actually loans at, lo at competitive interest rates, which are provided for the long term. That is currently prevented under European state aid rules, and we should actually immediately deny those state aid rules, and bearing in mind we're leaving on the 31st of October, and actually take up the uh, approach of providing this long-term capital. Then, of course, British Steel has had to also face a competition regime, which is provided by the European Union. When we leave the European Union, or immediately, which would be our argument, we ought to have a competition regime that looks at what is happening in the UK, that actually provides competition rules that favour UK consumers, that actually provides competition in the UK, 
not in the Europe-wide market. Because the competition rules in the EU, of course, look at the way in which competition interacts across the entire continent. Which means that for companies like British Steel, they're looking at whether in fact competitive rules favour Central and Eastern European countries within the European Union. Steel production in Central and Eastern Europe has effectively been, been um, given priority over British steel. And the European competition uh, regime has literally uh, favoured in terms of the way in which um, funding takes place uh, companies that have driven British steel out of business completely wrongly. Uh, it is also, of course, allowed us to be in a situation where we haven't actually put in place anti-dumping measures for surplus Chinese steel uh, in the way that, say, the United States did, where they put in punitive tariffs to stop Chinese steel dumping in the US. The UK did not pursue that, partly because of government policy, but also partly because those punitive measures <coughs> were not available to us because actually the EU set the anti-dumping tariffs. So again, the European Union membership has created a public policy framework which has been prejudicial to the long-term sustainability of strategic industries like British Steel. <clears throat> and then we've also, of course, got the problem of the environmental energy regime. Because carbon trading takes place on a Europe-wide level, uh, we have distortions in that carbon trading market. I mean, we have Germany burning the dirtiest fuel on earth, lignite. Uh, and yet uh, the UK, which is a very relatively clean uh, environment for energy production, uh, has a carbon trading regime that has taken into account what is happening in, again in Central and Eastern Europe. If there are offsets purely within the UK, bearing in mind that the rest of the UK economy is quite clean, then the cost of carbon trading for companies like British Steel would be lower. So the carbon trading regime has also prejudiced British Steel and strategic industries like British Steel. So you've got a whole set of policy uh, frameworks there within the European Union, which has been very prejudicial to strategic industries. And bearing in mind that we need to maintain these industries if we're going to be a truly sovereign and independent state, that really is just not acceptable. And we need to change that framework in order to favour uh, our own uh, industries so that we can actually be a sovereign and independent state. Now, however free market, however strongly free market we might want to be, it is still very, very important that we actually are able to provide for industries that actually underpin the UK as an independent nation. There is no other nation on earth that is an independent nation that would not do that. The United States, Japan, uh, Korea and so on all actually act as a government to support those sorts of industries. The reason that it's been distorted within the context of the EU is that the EU acts as if the EU itself were a state and that the UK is simply a province of that state. Once we are a separate independent nation, we can act in the way that actually provides for the best interests of Britain, the UK, as an independent nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I, um, I say this with the greatest of, uh, sort of some trepidation and, and, and respect, um, being in a, a, a Scunthorpe, Scunthorpe United football club, but I was delighted to read, when researching a bit more into British Steel, that my beloved Liverpool used British Steel when building their recent stand and its new stadium. Um, anyway, uh, so thank you for that, John. And to my next speaker, who is Simon Boyd. Simon is the chief executive of a business that's been going for about 100 years, Reed Steel. He's also 
uh, a member of the Manufacturing Council of the CBI, so knows just how that organisation and lobbying group works or does not work. Um, as well as Simon has also been a very long-standing Eurosceptic because he knows the impact of the European Union on the steel business. So it's fantastic that Simon is able to be with us here with us this morning. Simon, look forward to seeing you. Hi, good morning, everyone. A um, little bit of background about me, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Christchurch in Dorset. <laughs> and uh, no, it is really great to be back up north. Uh, I, I love the hospitality that I had here last night. I think the last time I was in this area, I was doing a job for Collarall in Gainsborough, just uh, down the road. But that was about uh, 30 years ago when we still had an industry that uh, manufactured wallpaper, I think it was that they were doing. But anyway, a little bit about uh, me. I, I started off in a Clyde shipyard. Um, and in the 70s, not long after we uh, joined the so-called common market, we saw a vacuum created and everything started to get sucked down to the south of England and a lot of jobs went down the road, partly due to a lack of investment in manufacturing and shipbuilding. And, uh, but it saw a lot of people going out of work. The core industry started to collapse, uh, in, certainly in the Clyde, and then that filtered down to the northeast through the Midlands. And, uh, well, I'm, I can't go any further south now, and I don't speak French too well, so... <laughs> and, um, but um, our company was founded, uh, ironically, in France in 1919 by a chap called Colonel Reid, who, after the Gallipoli battle in World War I, set up the little business in France, got bombed out in the Second World War, and set up shop in Christchurch in Dorset. And uh, we've worked in 140 countries in our 100-year history across the world. So we work throughout the UK, uh, through Europe, if you ever get a chance to work in Europe. And uh, it's actually easier for us to export to Mongolia than it is to France, which is 60 miles as the crow flies from, a, from our site. In fact, we can work in every French-speaking nation across the world except for France. And that's just down to rampant protectionism that goes on throughout the European Union. But how I really got engaged with this was in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, I started to see the demise of British standards. Now, British standards uh, were seen by many as the finest in the world. And we, you know, uh, we, for an example, we've got 150 buildings in the Caribbean. All of them withstood a Category 5 hurricane in 2017, all made to British standards with British steel, while the American buildings and the Chinese buildings took off into the uh, Atlantic. Our buildings are still there today and indeed <coughs> along with British Steel and other people we're rebuilding one of the schools out in Totola at the moment as some kind of gift back to the people who, who lost just about everything out there. But this is a really ser serious issue on uh, standards and regulation. Um, companies like us, we're a medium-sized business um, we have been held back and restrained by the, the shackles of the European Union over the last few decades. That's resulted in a lack of investment, poor productivity has uh, been the result of that. And when we actually uh, voted to leave in 2016, uh, we were so relieved, we immediately put into plans to build a new state-of-the-art manufacturing uh, facility, which due to start construction, uh, in uh, early next year. So, uh, because we want to get ourselves ready to take advantage of being, uh, you know, a world trading nation again. And um, the only way we're ever going to, we're, we're ever going to get con get this control back is if we protect the key industries. And our company, for example, does defence structures. We've been in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sudan, uh, and uh, in all the difficult areas, providing defence structures, uh, buildings for feeding the world. I can't name the agency that we work for there because I'm got all these uh, agreements that I have to sign. And all this, British designed, British manufacturing, British steel. And um, What's really happened to British Steel, in uh, my view, uh, well, actually it's a fact, is the unfair competition that's crept through. And uh, I did a job just down the road here at Rotherham on one of the old British Steel sites um, where they've got now an energy from waste uh, centre there. 
we had the skills to design and put the bridge in, but we didn't have a chance of getting the big job, all the structural steel work and the cladding for the, for the great big you know, 3,000 tonne building that was going to be built. That went to a Portuguese company who then employed Eastern European labour and have nothing against competition at all, providing it's fair. Uh, but that competition was so unfair because people aren't paying the same energy prices as we're paying in this country. The subsidies that are going out through the back door into uh, uh, people that we're competing against in the European Union, coupled with the regulatory burden that we have to have, uh, uh, makes us less competitive in our domestic market, let alone the damage it does in the international market. And that's why we need to really, you know, we are going to leave the European Union, there's no question on that now. We need to steel ourselves, we need to support uh, the right people to lead us out of this uh, terrible union. Uh, and, uh, it's, you know, I love Europe. It's not the people, it's not anything like that, it's just the damage it's done to businesses like us. And, uh, you know, as far as British Steel goes, uh, again, you know, we, as a medium-sized business, we like employee share employees are the business so i really think it's a great idea to involve uh, the employees of british steel in ownership of their business along with some government ownership which is in the interest of all of us because without british steel what what have we got you know we we would have to import everything from somewhere else to, for our defence structures, for our infrastructure, you know, for shipbuilding, which I want to see coming back when we get outside of the European Union. That I already know that the Association of British Ports has been looking at Hull and other places with massive investment, you know, as a result of us leaving. That's, I think that's all gone on hold now because, you know, we didn't leave when we were supposed to leave and uh, we must leave by the October date, that, that's without question. Um, I think uh, if British Steel was to be left to die, it would be the biggest single act of self-harm by any government uh, in this country. And, <laughs> and businesses like us, you know, the, the British Constructional Steelworks Association, which I I actually left after 30 years a member over CE marking because that's one of the biggest cons going, you know, the community of European nominalisation, which doesn't mean anything safe, doesn't mean it's a mark of quality. We want to get back to that British standard that really actually meant something, that was a quality thing that people would, you know, overseas, you know, and we've worked in 140 countries, oh, British standards, yes, you don't have to change anything as long as you've got British standards. You can, do the, you can do the job. And it's a, it's a key point. The Euro codes have been forced upon the industry. And the British Standards Institute is in cahoots with the community via European normalisation. They have a seat uh, around the table there, along with all the other states. Uh, they're a private entity now. They should be taken back under government control. And their charter, which used to read that it would work in the interest of British business, needs to be reinstated. Because they're not working in the interest of British business. They're working in the interests of their shareholders and the bottom line out of their membership of SEN. And we need to get that back. And I've, I've written on this subject, but um, I worry about some politicians who don't seem to understand. And if you look at the withdrawal agreement that we had, forget the Irish backstop, which was politicised, you know, weaponised to try and uh, uh, keep us locked into the European Union. It's the rest of that agreement that was so damaging to businesses like us. It would be like we'd, it would be exactly what we were before. We, you know, regulatory, we would be told what to do, what standards we've got to comply with by, a, in effect, a foreign body. How can we be an independent nation if we've still got one leg in, you know, and it's chained in and you can never do anything about it? So I'm not going to go on too much more, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to get a punt in about the stadium here because if I got the job to do this, I'd use British Steel. So just, I uh, don't know if anybody's listening. <laughs> uh, and actually, we could, it's actually uh, mostly our design that's up there it was pinched by some unfavourable contractor that we were looking at with this job, but I wouldn't, wouldn't mind doing it. Give you, give you a good price, have to pay the electric bill. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to get a punt in here. But um, 
really, you know, I, I am so, uh, um, you know, back in the, you know, when I fought the retention of the opt-out from the Working Time Directive. So, and I'll just finish on this note. I didn't know much about the EU. I knew something wasn't going right, but I had to learn pretty quick. And um, it felt like back then it was like a grain of sand on a railway track trying to get a locomotion going because nobody was listening to me. And it was really, really difficult. So I took a poll throughout the steel industry and asked the people on the shop floor, which is where I come from anyway, how many of you want to have your working hours restricted? And do you know what? 90% of those polled throughout the industry didn't want any form of restriction on the working hours. And I understand why, because we might want to buy a new car, we might have a hot date on a Friday night, you know, there's a whole wonder of reasons why you go in and you work overtime. And this sector is highly skilled, and people forget that. You can't just uh, open up the door and say, I need some fabricator welders, I need some uh, steel erectors, I need some good sheeters. These take years to train, years of investment. And it would have finished the industry had that opt-out been taken away. I could see that, you know, how could you have your erectors in the Shetlands been told that they have to sit in the van and wait till Monday because they've run out of hours that week? They'd be having a fit. The only reason they work away from home is to earn the extra cash. We have people out in the Falklands just now, they've only been there for about a year, so we're probably a bit over the allocated 37 hours a week. But, but none of them are complaining about it because I'm sure their mortgages will be more or less paid off when they get back. They do complain, however, about the penguins. So I think on that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over it if I'm all right. I forgot to watch the clock. Thank you. Simon, thank you very much. We're very lucky to have that sort of experience and direct um, knowledge about the workings of the industry. And when you hear that it seems easier to work in Mongolia than France, you truly know something is wrong about the competition. None of us mind fair competition, but unfair competition is completely wrong. And we see the impact, the uncertainty on thousands of jobs, direct jobs of British Steel here in Scunthorpe and the tens of thousands of indirect jobs that are also at risk and faced with uncertainty because of the lack of clarity and the lack of commitment from the government that actually this is a strategic national industry that needs to be protected, that needs to be grown and needs to be developed with long-term patient capital. And that brings me on to uh, the third speaker Jake Pugh and it's a, a mark of the quality and we've always made this point at the Brexit Party of the quality of candidates that we had uh, as MEP candidates um, that we have here in Jake someone who's a specialist in the world of finance and, and an Im and specialist also on the impact of EU regulations on a range of industries including the steel industry so Jake look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Good morning, everyone. Um, like John, I uh, just want to reiterate the amazing uh, honour to be elected to represent the people of Yorkshire and the Humber. Um, see some friends in the audience. Thank you for your continued support. Um, we're going to go to the EU to do two things, is to get us out as quickly as, as we possibly can, but also, of course, to represent the regional and national interests as best as we can while we are there. The motto we are adopting is hired to be fired. So as, as, as Richard said, I've um, the last 10 years in my business, I've been helping firms understand the implications of EU regulations. So uh, John and Simon have spoken very eloquently about some of the business costs, the anti-competitive, the protectionism. I'm going to talk a little bit more about EU regulation and how that links specifically with the party policy to pursue a clean Brexit and that's and why that is so important. So in terms of the, of the emissions trading scheme, this is the EU emissions trading scheme is the biggest carbon trading scheme in the world that necessarily creates higher costs for all market participants. The extraordinary thing as well is it actually increases uh, speculation which has a distortive effect 
on costs and economic outcomes. Um, in late December, um, the EU Commission, on two consecutive days, made two fundamental determinations around two different industries. One was the steel industry and the UK's participation in the emissions trading scheme. Another one related to financial services, which I, I won't bore you with the detail of that. But what the Commission did in two consecutive days, it said, right, as far as, so remembering we're still within the European Union in late December, the dates were around the 18th, 19th, 20th of December. We're still a member of the European Union, but we, the Commission, unelected, appointed representatives, we will decide on two consecutive days that for the purposes of emissions trading, the UK is a third country and outside the scheme which had a negative implication, significantly negative implication for British Steel because they needed to secure a loan of over 100 million from the government. And on the following day, it pursued a policy to say that the UK was a third country, but was deemed to be equivalent. So this is the commission deciding on two consecutive days, two completely different policies. And those policies were purely to look after their own interests. Why this is so important is that, and this is why we pursue a clean Brexit, because uh, Simon's already touched on the backstop. The other 584 pages of the withdrawal agreement is even worse. Under the implementation or transition period, for the entire duration of that period, potentially in perpetuity, we are going to be subject to EU regulations and we have no seat at the table. That is the craziest thing any country could ever possibly do. And I have seen directly in financial services, which is where I spend most of my time, the EU is deliberately developing regulations to undermine British industry. Financial services, they are pursuing regulations to weaken the city of London and they've had exact, done exactly the same thing with British Steel, with the, the how they adjusted British Steel's participation in the emissions trading scheme. This is real stuff, jobs being removed from this country, undermining the industrial and economic framework of this country and the withdrawal agreement wants us to accept those terms in perpetuity. That is the craziest thing anybody could ever do. It's a bit like asking anybody here, would you ever sign an employment contract that didn't give you the right to give notice? Nobody in their right mind would ever do that and that is what the withdrawal agreement requires. So I'm not going to say much more because um, colleagues on the panel have said a lot about the, the competitive effects and we want obviously to, to be able to take your questions. The, the craziest thing of all is the scheme that the EU has created around emissions which so impacted British Steel, it's creating a barrier, a protectionist wall around the EU, but strangely enough carbon dioxide and international capital flows very freely over the top of those protectionist walls. We need to get out on a clean Brexit as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. And, you know, when we actually dig into the detail of the impacts of EU regulations and just how they behave, and how, much, how their actions work against the interests of the United Kingdom. We know why. We have to leave, and we have to leave now. And if we had left, as we were promised, on the 29th of March, then things could be very different now for British Steel. And it's interesting to reflect, why has British Steel been struggling? It's not because of the fact that uh, it wasn't productive, or that the quality of what it produces is not good enough. No, the reason is three things that have absolutely nothing to do with the business. The first is business rates. The business rates for British Steel here are some 80% more than the equivalent business rates for a similar business in Holland. Secondly, energy costs. The energy costs 
here in the UK now, because of government policy, are double that of France and about 50% more than that in Germany. And thirdly, as Jake was touching on, the impact of the emissions trading scheme, again, a European trading scheme. These things are nothing to do with British Steel and there is absolutely nothing that they can do about it. And that's why when we leave, and leave we will, leave we will, ladies and gentlemen, when we leave, we can take back control of some of these issues so that we can act properly to protect these strategic national interests. And it's interesting, isn't it? Um, one of our other elected MEPs, June Mummery, a specialist in the world of fishing, and she quite rightly reminded us that, of course, when we take back control of our fishing waters, guess what we're going to need more? Boats. Boats, ladies and gentlemen, that should be built in Britain using British steel. So we believe that British steel is a strategic national industry and we're going to set up a working group including uh, the members that you've heard from uh, this morning as well as another MEP Brian Monteith who couldn't be here today but who was elected for the North East which has also got steel interests. So we'll have a working group that will monitor what's going on with British steel, how the government uh, is reacting to it, what happens to this supposed sale process at the moment and then also makes recommendations going forward but we will be looking at a new type of ownership which will be a sort of strategic national corporation which will blend the best of private sector expertise and capital, long-term patient state capital and I mean long-term as well as improving productivity through as John referred earlier a form of share ownership so that you have a sort of a John Lewis style form of share ownership for the workers in the business and we'll be making some specific proposals in due course but we believe that is the right way to approach such an important industry as the steel industry so without further ado that's uh, that's all from us but we have got time for some questions uh, initially perhaps from one or two members of the press and then anyone broader uh, the lady in the uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, just 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 behind you yeah. in the uh, horizontal strike. Um, hi, um, hi um, my name is Helen Pitt. I'm hi, the Helen. North of England editor of The Guardian. Um, I just wonder what you'd say to um, remarks made by Gareth Stace, who's the director general of UK Steel, oh. a trade body. And he warned that um, a hard Brexit, a no deal Brexit could cause a great deal of damage to steel exports. And he also said that even if we're operating under WTO rules, the UK's ability to provide any state aid support would be still severely limited. And we fundamentally well, disagree with him. We, we fundamentally disagree with him. He is just wrong. You know, it's simple as, and I'm afraid some of these industry lobbying groups, they are part of the establishment and they are simply wrong. What is most important to make British Steel competitive, it's not the tariffs, it's the cost of the business rates, it's the energy and it's the emission trading scheme. So frankly, you know, he is just simply wrong on this. Uh, and, and there's nothing more we can say. You know, we've looked at his comments. We think he's wrong. Uh, you know, we think that actually taking back control gives us the ability to make this a strategic national industry. We just don't think that he is thinking uh, big enough, bold enough, and in control of our own destiny. Can I just? Uh, <laughs> but sorry, Simon, please add to that. Uh, one, two. Are we there? Yep. <laughs> back on stage again. Sorry. Um, uh, I'd just like to say something on that. As, as a user of steel, um, you know, we're uh, investing because we see uh, our productivity increasing as a result of being outside the EU. 70% uh, of our product is export. Uh, almost all of it goes outside the European Union because of the restrictions to selling into the single market. Uh, and we see enormous growth in South America, Africa, and the Far East and uh, there'll soon be much more development work in the Middle East as things start to settle down in, in, in certain areas there. So we work very hard at exporting and um, you know we need to get British steel in good shape so that we can export into the future and encourage more people to export. You know I, I don't know where they're coming from if they think uh, we're going to go backwards, we're going to go forwards.
Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, I think we are at. Uh, my name's Des Comerford, and I'm chairman of the Keeps Gunthorpe Alive campaign group, which is quite apt given the state of the British steel industry and our plant in Scunthorpe. Um, thank you very much to the Brexit party and uh, guest speakers for coming along uh, to host this in Scunthorpe. Your desire to maintain a, a British steel industry producing world-renowned quality products is to be admired because the other parties have not shown that commitment. Thank you very much indeed. Hi there, Jamie Waller from the Scunthorpe Telegraph. Hi. Um, obviously this is a really worrying time for the people of Scunthorpe. Do you have a message for can steel be saved? Do you think there's still hope for the industry here? Of course, without any doubt whatsoever, um, you may have spotted over the weekend that um, uh, the Brexit Party is topping the national polls, having won the, the last uh, national election. Um, so we look forward to a general election uh, just as soon as possible, um, because if we were uh, in government, uh, as we've just explained, then the steel industry could be certain of, uh, you know, strong commitment, strong protection, so that it can be invested in and developed and grow going forwards. And, you know, that, that is... That is what we mean when we say let's change politics for good. You know, these are serious, serious issues, long-term issues for communities like Scunthorpe, and that's what a government should work with and develop. And what is patently clear to us, the more we've looked into it, <coughs> is that actually uh, these industries, these strategic national industries, just haven't had that long-term commitment. And the reason for that, I believe, is frankly average quality politicians in Westminster coupled with the, the, the hideous uh, impact of European Union regulations. And when we take back control of our own industries, our own borders, regulations and the economy, we can make that difference so that you can actually genuinely invest in these communities and these industries. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, my name is Bernard Theobald. Um, in 2005, I stood uh, for a Member of Parliament in the general election as a candidate in Scunthorpe, and I stood against the then sitting MP Elliot Morley. He won, I went home, he went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Scunthorpe was very poorly served at that time, and I think it's in danger of being very poorly served again. Uh, and it's interesting, when we talk about stepping away uh, pre uh, leaving Europe from EU regulations. The danger of that is, I think, in Parliament, is there is no commitment to leave. I don't believe that the politicians that we employ at this moment in Parliament believe seriously that we're going to leave. And that's what is going to stop them taking that route, which I think would be a sensible move, but I don't believe they, there is that commitment at the moment. We're also in danger, I mean, a general election would be terrific. And if we win, the Brexit party win on Thursday, it pushes the general election even further away. Because then I think Labour will stop calling for a general election because they too will be afraid of what the outcome of that is likely to be. So the only realistic way of leaving Europe is to leave with a no deal. That gives us 39 billion pounds that we can reinvest in the industries in this country, which is a substantial amount of money. The Leaving with no deal doesn't mean there is no permanent no deal. It just means that we haven't got a deal at the point of departure. Anybody who then believes that Europe is not going to talk to us ever again is living in cuckoo land. Of course. Europe will beat a, door, a, a, a path to our door to discuss what we're going to do about future trading relationship. Sorry? No, I don't really have a question other than that I think we should leave without a deal. And if we are going to leave without a deal, how are we going to implement that? Because at the moment, there is no appetite for that in Parliament. And therefore, I don't see how we're going to be able to do that unless we can come up with some radical idea of making the politicians change their mind and starting to work towards leaving. Well, I think, I mean, just picking up on the point about um, uh, how we're going to leave, you know, uh, let's see what happens with the leadership context, uh, contest of the Conservative Party. Uh, there's, I mean, who knows, there's about a rugby team, let alone a football team, uh, of, of candidates. Um, we'll see. But uh, rest assured, we will be holding them to account. Um, you know, we're already planned to leave six months too late. We will be holding them to account. We won uh, the European election. We secured 50% more votes than any other party. And we stood on the platform of 
a WTO Brexit and that some of our selected MEPs, and you've heard the sort of quality and expertise and wisdom of them, that was part of our platform that we should take part of the negotiating team. And you're quite right that uh, when we leave with a, on a WTO basis, then we've got maximum leverage to negotiate the future arrangements and deals that work for our benefit. So we will be working incredibly hard and continuing to make further announcements to try and secure that departure. But it's a challenge because you're quite right, too many of the MPs do not want to leave. <coughs> question here at the front. Is any other question from the press? Yes, hello. Uh, Paul Hi. Murphy from the BBC. You mentioned... Hi, um, hi. Uh, mentioned abandoning the carbon trading scheme when we leave the EU. What would you intend to replace that with in order to mitigate the carbon emissions from Scunthorpe Steel? Well, the great thing is that we would be in control of our own scheme. You heard earlier uh, from Jake about a scheme that basically where they manipulate the rules and the regulations uh, to suit their own needs. So, of course, you know, climate is absolutely, climate change and the impact is, 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 is very important. We all need to properly understand it and mitigate it. But we need to do it in a way that works for our economy and our strategic interests. My, my question was, how, how would you do it? Well, that, that's things that we will be looking at and making further recommendations as a party going forward. And we do have some great specialists in climate change within our elected MEPs and also the candidates um, who actually weren't, uh, weren't elected. Yes, Jake, yeah. So I think two things is that it's important to understand the existing scheme creates unnecessary speculation. So it's quite technical, but effectively large producers of carbon dioxide are granted free allowances. So you're granted a free allowance at the beginning of 2019 to allow which you then sell to meet your 2018 obligation. That creates unnecessary speculation in the capital markets by energy and industrial firms. So that's just a crazy thing and you need to change that. The other thing I would say is, in politics right now, there is no appetite for materially reducing employment or uh, climate change commitments. But that, that is just not something that has any political traction. So we're persistently told we're going to be particularly in the capital markets where I come from, we're going to be like offshore Singapore. It's absolutely nonsense. We actually gold plate the key regulations in the city of London versus other financial centres in Europe. It's just an absolute mistruth to say that we fundamentally want to erode, erode standards. So there's any number of ways in which we can improve the scheme. Give me one. By stopping the the passage of free allowances and how those are used by firms to speculate. You can absolutely change the way that scheme operates. That's one of the reasons Grable needed a loan. Hi. Hi, uh, Amy Murphy. Amy Murphy from the Press Association. Hi. Um, in 2016, Mr Farage tweeted that a vote to remain would mean the end of the British steel industry. Um, a vote to leave doesn't seem to have helped with that. I mean, what, what have you got to say about that? Well, hang on, hang on. <laughs> we, it's very simple. We haven't left. Parliament is trying to... No, 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 you've asked though. your question. You've we asked your question. To leave. I'll answer it. We haven't left yet, and what's happened? We've got an industry, a strategic national industry, that, is, that has just collapsed because of the EU rules and regulations. If we had left by now, then it would not be in the state that it's currently in. You've heard from Jake. Hello? Can I say something in that? Yeah. Just want to say something in that. Look what's happened to British manufacturing while we've been in the EU. It's been crushed. We've been over-regulated. You know, there, are, there is good regulation and there is bad regulation. There are, and there's also anti-competitive regulation. And, you know, just look. Uh, the Ford Transit factory in Southampton given EU money to ship uh, its production to Turkey while we were in the EU. You know, look what's happened in the Midlands. Uh, Jagger Land Rover uh, now uh, getting some funding in Slovakia to, to make the cars over there. And if it comes to emissions, they'll then have to transport them all back to here, to the showrooms here, to sell to the to sell to the public here. Our manufacturing uh, base has been destroyed uh, and everything has gone sliding over into Central Europe or, or, and now more, more easterly. We've got to get it back. There was, there was also mention yeah. that... Um, 
the other members of of the EU cheat to get around all the regulations? And I mean, what what would what's to stop Britain doing that? Well, we're just not like that, are we? We tend to we tend but, to do. But then do. that's not an EU issue, though, is no, no, it? No, no, no. Well, hang on a minute. Uh, are... I'll give you I'll give you a cracking example. Yeah. If I didn't follow the construction products regulations, I can face three months in prison. Okay, that's the reality for me. And I take my responsibilities to my staff and anybody else that's affected by our actions seriously. Health and safety, the number one driver. I don't want anybody hurt on my watch. Yet when I go to Brussels, I watch them flout the rules and regulations, even on their own building, lifting glass over the heads of the public in the street. I even took it up when Timmerman's office said you can't even get your own house in order. You're regulating everywhere else and destroying it and destroying industry right across Europe, particularly in the South and in the UK. They just do what they like. And just to add to that, two things. I've you know, thought long and hard about this over the years I've been in business and uh, the whole business about uh, the EU floating the rules. Um, we have to remember the European Union naturally was actually created for the benefit of French agriculture and German manufacturing. So the frameworks in which they operate don't uh, effectively, you know, those opt-outs, those get-outs favour the core members, the original f people who formed the European Union and not the UK. I mentioned the KFW Bank, for example, earlier, uh, which is very significant. I mean, 39 billion euros into the German economy, free of state aid rules, is a massive, massive and anti-competitive advantage. So you can replicate that example, we're only talking about one industry today, but you, I could replicate that example across a swathe of uh, industries and sectors. Secondly, however, there is a fundamental um, problem in relation to the way in which the UK has developed versus the rest of the continental Europe in terms of our legal framework and philosophy. You know, we are based on English law and continental Europe is based on Napoleonic law and we have a completely different view of the way in which things should operate and it's wrong that we should actually decide to become corrupt in order to operate within a European Union system. So. It, it, it is a fundamental issue. English, English law says you can do anything you want unless it's prohibited. Continental law says you can do nothing unless it's permitted. I mean, that is a fundamental issue. And that continental law, therefore, leads people to cheat. It's not our way. It's it is a very good example of why we do not sit well within the European Union. Thank you. Got one question. <laughs> Microphone just coming, hopefully. Does it work? Yeah. Hi, my name's Jerry Gorman, lifelong steel industry uh, person. Had the privilege of running this works in uh, 1990. Since then, I've worked all over the world, and I tell you, there's no level playing field. We are hampered. We've seen the works here. It's been stripped out. Assets that should have been mothballed have been sold, right? There isn't a return. That's been done for dubious reasons by foreign owners. Now, the question was asked about Nigel Farage and uh, whether there's a steel industry. I'm a member of a consortium that for five years has been trying to bring a new steel industry to Scunthorpe or to the UK. We've been thwarted by problems with the government, by energy prices, we have a foreign investor, but that foreign investor isn't prepared to come here while there's uncertainties with Brexit. The sooner we're out, the better. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any, any other questions? Sorry, we'll take two more because then we've got to wrap up. Hi. Right, my name's Derek Target. I'm uh, probably older than most people in this room. Um, We've got to go back to 1946 to see the problem we've inherited. After 1946, we bailed them out. We did everything we could, the Americans and the British, to put Europe back on its feet. They've never forgiven us for that. They feel obliged, and they didn't want to feel obliged. So now they've been kicking us in the teeth all the time and ruining our industries to protect theirs. And it's about time we did something about it. Thank you. That's, that's
last one. Just one more here, and then, and then we're, we're just at the front here. What? Thanks. Hi, thank you. My name's Stuart Bright. Uh, I'd like to come back to something slightly more local. Your panel have given us a, one, a plethora of ideas and what the European Union have done to be anti-competitive towards us. But does not the latest thing with Grey Bull, the asset strippers, cap in hand in for loans from our government at the same time as negotiating with Europe to buy a plant in France, absolutely demonstrate where we are? Do, is that not where we are in the UK versus Europe scenario? Well, I mentioned in, in my presentation that I think in these strategic industry areas, uh, you know, we need, if we're going to provide a public policy environment which is less competitive than our normal free market competitive uh, approach as a, as a country, we have to be able to incentivize the way in which the companies are owned. So it has to be a mixture of private capital, of long term patient capital loans and also preferably employee share ownership so that incentivizes productivity and locks the company uh, down as a British company. We could of course also have a situation where the government itself takes a golden share uh, as they did with Rolls-Royce for example which is a vital defense industry uh, business so that we prevent the sort of things happening which have happened in the past where companies are bought by foreign ownership and assets stripped and so on uh, to the detriment of the UK. I mean, there are ways in which this can be done. Other countries do it all the time. I mean, the French operate golden shares across their entire economy. The Germans have supervisory boards which prevent acquisition of companies in Germany. The Americans, of course, have a situation where they will use defence as a reason for people not to be able to purchase sectors of their economy. It happens everywhere. Um, but, of course, the UK is, to some extent, prevented from doing it, not just by the attitude of government, but also by the EU rules, which uh, effectively prevent us from operating a successful industry. But those issues are separate from the EU itself and we should actually operate in a way that is in the interest of the UK. L sorry, l last one there and then I'm going to wrap up. Sorry. I'm, I'm Sally from Birmingham. I don't need a microphone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sally, Liz. <laughs> um, I would just like to know what the government has offered to do to help this area in particular because we've heard nothing. Well, that's the point. And to be honest, Sally, that's why we're here. You know, we're going to be following very closely what the government are doing. And our concern is that we're just hearing that they're looking for private sector buyers. Well, I think what we've heard is that actually, uh, you know, it's not good enough because your average private sector buyer, a private equity business, is probably going to be looking for uh, their return over a four to seven year period. An industry like this, a strategic national industry, Yes, of course, investment needs a return, but you need to be looking at a return over a 15 to 30 year period. Jake, have you got just... No, I was just going to pick up the point you're making, Sally. It's absolutely right, is that here you have a situation where you've got a Conservative government the night before the company goes into administration making, you know, over a period of a few weeks, making a series of decisions and loans the night before. I mean, it's just crazy. You've got the other party basically assuming Marxist economics is going to solve everything. Both, both parties in turn have had 40 years to think about how to identify and set up structures for strategic national industries. Brexit party's been going for, for eight weeks. Everyone goes, you haven't got any policies. So we react to what happened in the region during the, the campaign and come back up here with ideas. We haven't got the solutions yet, but I hope you believe that there's a common sense, pragmatic approach to this. We're doing things that successive governments of left and right have failed to do for the last 40 years. There is Awesome, because I know you've been very patient, like patient capital, really. I'm, I'm Sally from Spencer. Another Sally. <laughs> I don't actually need one of these, but I'll use it. Um, I've got two very simple questions. Um, I live in Scunthorpe, and I'm proud to be in Scunthorpe. 
I have no direct relationship with British Steel except to say I do care very much. My simple question about British Steel is you say that we're going to leave no later than the 31st of October. What's going to happen to British Steel between now and then? Can we save them? Well, it's a really good question. That, that is your question. I have um, one other question. Ask that and then answer, answer both at the same time. What are we going to do about John Burko? <laughs> They're both great questions. They're both great questions. He, 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 um, he will trip everybody up, left, yeah. right, and Chelsea. Uh, the, the bottom line is, um, we, we, we're here now. We are, we are on the political stage, and we will battle away with whatever measures and means we can to make sure that we do leave on the 31st. And in a sense, Burko is part of that issue and that problem and that challenge, and you're quite right to highlight it. Um, but it, and in terms of British Steel, well, again, we're here, we're going to be watching, and we are going to be making some, some strong recommendations and challenging the government, and if, assuming the Conservative Party, if they want to continue uh, to be a governing party, uh, they need to listen, and they need to listen to sensible ideas, long-term investment ideas from people of the quality of this panel that you've seen this morning, people who've worked in business, are still working in business, understands how investment works, and knows what is right for this country, our economy, and our strategic national industries. Thank you very much. Well, it, we, it, to answer your question, yes, this country must save British Steel. How, you know, and specifically how we do it over the next few weeks is what needs to work. Yeah, I'd just say that, you know, I'm not a politician, uh, but I'm doing everything I can through the contacts I've got in British Steel, the contacts at the CBI, the contacts that I have in the political circles to make sure that they see British Steel as serious as it is. You know, I mean, I would just go mad if Brit British Steel was left to die. It is, it is part of us. It is a country really you know there was nobody more proud than me after Tata bought it off chorus when they rebranded the British Steel element British Steel again and you know it's, it's a great advert for export you know we mustn't we mustn't let it go and uh, you know with people like you here uh, supporting this we won't let them I'm sure if you put the same question to the people about British Steel, British Steel would get an awful lot of support from <coughs> the people. Yeah. 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 So how do we do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's why we're here, yeah, as Jake says. I mean, I reiterate what Simon said. I mean, I'm doing exactly the same thing. We're all working through our channels, you know, my contacts in government, in business, through the trade associations and so on, to put pressure. I'm confident that British Steel will not be allowed to go. I mean, it, has, it cannot be allowed to go. It is an absolutely, you know, DNA of the UK economy. And it, it, we, we, will, we will do everything in our power. Now, I'm not particularly keen on politicians, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> I've never really liked them very much. I'm very dubious about them. I never thought, in fact, I'm not actually a politician technically until the 2nd of July, so I can still say that. Uh, and, but, you know, it, it has to be government policy, whoever is in government, uh, that actually dictates the future of British Steel now. And we must put maximum pressure on the UK government uh, to make sure. <laughs> well, that's that's another story. <laughs> the reality is that if the UK government just broke the rules and had to pay a fine, like a lot of other EU countries, we wouldn't pay it anyway. <laughs> they could intervene straight away. Yeah. Do whatever well, you to do. absolutely. Not pay the fine yeah. in 10 years, 20 years. Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly what I was saying, you know, exactly what I was saying. We're supposed to be leaving on the 31st of October. It's only a few months off. Do it now. Yeah. 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 So, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your interest. And, uh, you know, we are here and we are going to be absolutely maximising uh, the pressure on the government to ensure that this industry, British Steel and the steel industry, is, uh, it is protected. It is a strategic national industry. Thank you very much.